Hey you guys, this is Josh and Carolyn with Homesteading Family and welcome to this week's episode of the Pantry Chat Food for Thought. This week we're talking about ferments and compost and uh, all sorts of other things because we are answering your questions. That's right, but first we're going to get into a little chit chat, talk about the week, how things have been going around here and... Um, well, and then we're answering your questions all the way through, so we'll dive right into <laughs> if that. If you want to skip the chit chat and you're watching on YouTube, you can check the timestamps below because we have that all timestamp for you so you can move ahead. But you know, the chit chat's the fun part. You should hang out. That's right. A lot, <laughs> lot going on here. So right. anyways, but diving right in, um, how you doing and what's going on? We are like spring is, is finally springing around here. It's been a little slow coming. It, it's been slow. It's been a slow start. But that means, you know, you're kind of like, don't get going too fast. Don't get going too fast. But then when it gets here, Run. you have to make up all that time. And so, yeah, it's, it's like, go. It, it is go time around here, which mm -hmm. means we're starting to feel a little tired. There's a lot to do. The to-do lists are long. Starting? Starting, starting to, feel to feel tired. tired? Did that ever stop? <laughs> <laughs> we like to keep ourselves busy, you know, yeah. sometimes too busy. So anyways, um, spring is going. Things are popping up. Um, plants are popping up. Weeds are popping up. Uh, baby animals are popping popping out. <laughs> They're <laughs> popping all over the place. Lots of popping. So um, so we're just trying to keep up with the basics of that. Um, you know, do you know how to tell the difference when you've got all these little seedlings in your garden? Do you know how to tell the difference between the plant that you want, that you put in intentionally, and a weed? Uh, well, I can think of several different things. I'm not sure if you have some specific idea you're I do. getting to. I do, yeah. yeah. You you tug on it, you pull it out. If it comes out really easily, it was the plant you wanted. If it like is in there and it's not going to go anywhere, then it was a, a weed. I don't think that's a test you really want to <laughs> apply, though. I don't know about <laughs> <laughs> For brand new gardeners, that's a joke. Don't actually do that, okay? <laughs> but it's just a point that, you know, sometimes those things that you're trying to grow feel really delicate. And you're like, baby, baby, baby. Yeah. And then you're watching these weeds pop up all around. And you're like, you don't have to baby those things. Those things are nope. robust they're... and healthy. And those roots are locked into that soil. Well, so. <laughs> you know, and that's a whole discussion in and of itself. Because what we call weeds, you know, really weeds are anything you don't want in your garden or wherever you, whatever you're growing. In a place in, you don't want. I've added that part of the definition. In a place you don't want, right. Because that's why I said garden. And that could be different gardens. A sunflower gardens. could be a weed if it's in the wrong place. Absolutely. So you need to know what those plants are that you call weeds and why they're there. And the reason that those don't come out well is because they are very hardy. They are made to restore the ground because nature doesn't like bare ground. It doesn't like naked soil. It wants it covered. And so those plants are made to grow in difficult situations and pull nutrients and minerals up. So all that to say, they do have a value sometimes. And so just know that as you're building your paradigm and your, you know, what, what those weeds are, why they're there. And most of the time they gotta go. Uh, sometimes they can make good ground cover for an area. I even have to heard Joel Salatin talk about areas where the ground's been disturbed and it's been weedy and it's taken a few years, but they've actually let the weeds run their course because they are building soil. They're building up the ground. Now, we can't do that in a vegetable garden most of the time. That's right. counterproductive. Yeah. But they do have a purpose. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes Anyways. the purpose is to eat them. Sometimes they're very oh, edible. Absolutely. <laughs> a lot of times you're pulling out weeds and they are more nutrients. They're better than the, uh, the, the crop that you have planted there. Occasionally, that's because you don't like the taste of them as much, but, you know, dandelions, purslane. I love purslane. I will actually, a lot of times, let purslane go. It makes a low ground cover, so it doesn't grow up and compete with the plants. And, um, and it tastes great. It's a great snack. Delicious. Yeah. <laughs> Good. So, anyways, we've been trying to keep up with the growth around here, but along with that, that means we have our egg flush in right now. We are getting about 70 eggs a day, between 65 and 70 eggs a day. I just got to say, you asked for it. I, I did. I absolutely <laughs> She said asked we haven't been getting it. enough eggs the last couple of years. We haven't. And, you know, I don't want to buy eggs in the winter, so I want to have enough to preserve them for the whole winter. So 
Um, preserving eggs is a whole nother topic. We actually have an entire class on it, mini mm -hmm. class on it. You can check that out. I'll put the link in the description. But, um, but this year we're doing it. We're, we're definitely going to have enough eggs to get through the winter. Do you think this is too many for the homestead? Like, are we getting into having I, overflow to I, sell? Yes. Or? I think we're at the point where we could probably start selling eggs now. Okay. And, and we have enough to get us through the whole year, and now our excess can go into supporting the farm in a different way. Well, good. So we'll have to decide exciting. whether we want to go that route. Yep. Yeah, or reduce the amount of chickens, one or the other. Yep. Yep. <laughs> but right along with that, that mean the um, milk cow, just came into milk. I think we'll she you'll freshened. Yes. probably talk about that in a minute a little bit more, but that means today was the first day we got two and a half gallons of milk into the kitchen this morning. Yep. So and that's just to start. Get that's ready. Just to start. Because uh, Tilly will give six to eight gallons a day at her peak in about so three you, months. You can imagine that becomes a management project right away uh -huh. the, on the milk side. <laughs> There's only so much milk even our large family can consume. So we dive right into making cheese, making yogurts, making all sorts of great stuff and finding different ways to preserve the milk also, which is exciting. Butter, of course, butter. Butter, and Lots we were talking butter. maybe um, sour cream this year. More Make, sour Making cream. more sour cream. It's, it's always a battle with the cream how to best use the cream for your household. We've started making, growing more lard pigs with the Cooney Cooney so that we can um, replace some of that butter with lard, which is great. Right. Um, but then still, do you make sour cream? Do you make uh, butter? Do you make other things? So to put it in context though, for those of you guys who don't know us, we have a large family. Um, and so there are, right now, there are regularly 13 people at our meal table. Um, with a lot of meals, you know, when we have guests or other mm -hmm. family over or something like that, it goes up. That number goes up. So we have to make a lot of stuff, a lot of food. Um, and so in this like battle between what gets priority with the cream, uh, we've always kind of tended towards the butter. Just make the butter, make the butter. Well, when I started thinking about it, we can replace a lot of that butter with lard, which mm -hmm. is great. The only thing that people don't like replacing with lard is um, like if you're going to butter bread your at the potatoes, table. Your potatoes, your bread, you, where, yeah. yeah, where you're putting fresh butter on. You, you on, want that yeah. butter. At the table, flavor. you really want it there. Um, but the rest of it can go, and it's a lot easier to make lard than it is to make butter. However, making sour cream, the ingredients in sour cream at the grocery store are awful. It is not just cream and culture like it should be. Um, it's all sorts of other things. So I think we're going to start making our own sour cream as the priority, mm -hmm. and then the rest of it's going to go to butter and, and ice cream. And so these are decisions you've always got to make with different things that you're growing or producing on your homestead, and a dairy cow is really one of them. Where's the best value for your family? Yeah. We all tend to think of butter. That's what we tend to go to. But we also eat a lot of sour cream, and like Carolyn was saying, getting good, clean sour cream you know, that's basically organic and pure, very hard to do in the store. You can get pretty good butter. We have access right. to good butter. So if we've got to pick buying something, we've realized, you know what? Maybe we actually want to start making more sour cream, a little less butter, and then supplement the butter, especially since we've got the lard covered. Those are always, always important things to think about with your own situation and how your family uses things and what's the best use of the resources that you have. Absolutely. So, I'm excited. I, we, we eat quite a bit of sour cream. We eat a lot of Mexican food. Um, and potatoes, mm -hmm. we enjoy sour cream on. So I'm really excited at that thought of, of homemade sour cream. It's good. Yeah. It's going to be great. Very good. Okay. So what have you been up to? That's kind of all about what I've been up to. Wow. Well, we've just been adjusting through the wet season. It's been a wet, cold spring and yet having babies. We had one beef cow this last week or beef calf. Yeah, a little heifer and calf. A little heifer huh? calf. That went great. The goslings. Uh -huh. We've got new goslings, four of those. Mama oh, they're great. so cute. They're all fluffy and little and they just bob around behind yep. her. Oh my goodness. Yep. And then we do have a bummer side of the story here, and that is with dairy cow, we had a calving problem and we had to pull that calf and that calf did not survive. So that was a real bummer, real loss. Yeah. And we've, we're very selective about our animals. We, uh, you know, animal problems are often a result of genetics in your own care. 
And so we've been very careful over the years with the genetics that we purchase, animals that uh, ease of calving is a big deal when we, yeah. when we purchase a dairy cow or beef cow and in any animal. We want to see that they're birthing well. Mm -hmm. We want to know that they've got longevity. And then, and then we need to do our part with nutrition and feed and everything. With that though, we've had very low incidences of say calving problems and mm -hmm. other, um, you know, other medical problems. And I know this works for people. I'm reading through Joel's book, Polyface Micro, Joel Saladin. Great book, you guys, Polyface Micro. Uh, it's, it's all about animals on the homestead and pasturing. Fantastic book. A lot of it's stuff that I'm familiar with, but I really, really want to recommend that. I've been meaning yeah. to say this for a couple of weeks. We'll Great get book. a link down in the description for you guys. But, but so he talks about it. this. He talks about this in a section about disease. And he said, I straight up says, I don't have a lot to say because of our management practices. We've had very, we've had to do with very little. Yeah. So he's actually not the expert in that area. And we get people asking us questions. And I'm kind of the same way. Well, we followed a lot of those principles. Yeah. Anyways, coming back around, bad things still happen sometime. Mm -hmm. And we had a calf, and, and several of us were working on that calf, and I pulled on it for an hour and a half it took to get after she had been in labor for a long time. And uh, it was sad. It, it was a real bummer. I've not had to go through that before of just nurturing that life, trying to save that life uh, right there up close and actually losing it in the process and knowing that and yet still having to finish the job. And um, after talking to the vet, we could, it was a Sunday, couldn't get the vet there. Uh, in time. And um, after talking to him, it sounds like there was probably a deformity in the intestines because the calf came out bloated. Very and, extended and in the so, stomach. Yeah, yeah, some sort of, um, sometimes in the growth, the intestines don't develop. He had some technical terms I don't remember, but the calf will bloat and then it can't pass through well. Yeah. And um, and uh, so anyways, that, that was a little bit of a bummer. But we move on. We do compost those things as well. You can compost just about anything and we don't want to waste that life. And so that goes back to the land and continues to build soil fertility. It's a good lesson. It's always hard. You know, the kids are excited about the calf and all of us are excited mm -hmm. about the calf. And so there's always that little bit of hard, but it it's... We've gotten so removed from the cycle of life in our modern culture. Yeah. You know, we don't see death, really. It, we send we people off to the hospital. We send them away. You know, we don't experience that very often. And it's just a, a really good thing to remember. Our own mortality and the mortality of the people around us and the, the animals and the things around us. And uh, I think it's always a good good reflective moment. There, there is no real life without death. And that's a spiritual principle. And that's definitely a principle on the homestead that you get up and close with. Mm -hmm. But it's something important for us to realize. For us to live, something has to die. Um, sometimes there are, you know, uh, casualties that aren't expected like this calf. But mm -hmm. um, that is a cycle of life. And it's important. It's important for us. And it's really important for the kids. I think it's a much better perspective for them to work that through that too. Um, so, even in death, there's value sometimes, even yeah. though it's hard and sad. Anyways, you know, that's been a lot of the last week. We're, we're, yeah. we're stocking up on our grains. I am actually going today to purchase, I don't know what it is. It's probably 10 to 12 tons of feed. Wow. Uh, you know, for most of the year for us. And you guys don't wait to the fall. If yeah. you're on homesteads, if you're relying on gray, uh, gray, <laughs> hay and grain, <laughs> gray. Okay. Um, you need to be thinking about purchasing early in the season. Prices are already up if you're not aware of that. And um, this fall, when we come around to the harvest, it, they're likely going to be a lot higher. We, we've still got a lot of supply issues, and those are likely going to feel a lot worse when the wheat harvest that's coming in, should be coming in, is, is reduced, particularly on the world supply. So anyways, we're stocking up majorly, so I'm having to rearrange a whole bunch in the barn because I don't usually stock up quite that much. Yeah. Um, and getting ready for that, and um, that's about it. Besides working on STS, yeah, school of traditional skills. I'm working yeah. on that, and yeah. it's nice to have you here for two weeks in a row. Some we're enjoying that. Nice to be here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Think, good. And then I think we're going to lose you for a few weeks. Yeah, and we? I think uh, hey, if you guys are not familiar with Brandon Sheard, the Farmstead Meat Smith. Um, check him out, look him up. He is a fantastic resource and I'm going to be hanging out with him here soon and hopefully 
having him on the show with us. And that's going to be a fun conversation. He's a really neat guy. And our inspiration for a lot of um, butchering and meat processing. Yeah. 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 I, just getting to talk with him on a couple meetings this last week, I, I get so excited because when you get somebody who's really thinking through the depths of what they're doing, it, it's exciting. Yeah. So, and he's very passionate about curing pork particularly and um, proper butchering and raising of pork. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a very exciting yeah, thing and, to, and it, to talk to him. It is. And he brings a lot of poetic um, beauty to it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's that's it. Okay. Day in the life that's of. That's it. That's all you're doing. Week in the life of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Well, hey, we've talked enough, enough about us. Right? Let's get on to you guys, to them, <laughs> and uh, dive into the questions here. It looks like we've got a pretty good list of them today. And we're going to start with one for you, Carolyn. Cat K on how to ferment for long-term preservation. Let's see, I've been wondering if my ferments could be shelf stable for a while now because I run out of room in the fridge quickly. Sure understand that. I'm so excited to try this out and experiment. One question I have, I have access to a ton of my grandma's old bale lid canning jars. Do you think I could ferment in those if I, got, if I get new rubber seals for them? Yes, absolutely. The, um, the one trick that you're gonna have is during that active ferment phase, you have to make sure you're letting them vent out really well. <clears throat> so you may have to like tip them a little bit sideways, the lids on those bale ones, you know, you kind of like tip them um, just to make sure it can vent. And then when those bubbles come to a stop, you can then lock it down um, and you will want the new rubber lids. It kind of, the, the one challenge that you have with that is if you're using a mason jar, you can just lightly screw, like a, a modern mason jar with the two-part lids, you can just lightly screw that lid on so that it does rest down unless gas needs to escape. When you're using the old bale ones, you kind of have clamped or non-clamped. Those are your two options. You may possibly want to leave them unclamped just because you don't want to build up a ton of pressure inside there. Even after the initial active ferment, you are still gonna have a little bit of off gassing. So if you don't overfill it and you wait until that active ferment has really seriously died down, you can probably get away with capping it, like locking it all the way down. If you're not sure, I would just put the lid on and not lock it down <laughs> just to be sure because, you know, if the, if the um, gases can push their way out of the lid, they will, they'll do that and they'll, keep you from having an explosion. I'm gonna say they're gonna find their way to push out though one way or the other. Eventually the glass gives way under the pressure. Yeah. So you don't wanna do that, but cool. But yeah, so you can definitely use those. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay, Jennifer Misquith on how to create an instant garden. Okay. Lots of people like that. A lot of people thinking about gardening this year. So yep. and this, one's, this one's a good start if you just need to get something in quick. Yeah, yeah. you can do it. Thanks for the video. Why do you cut the grass and not just layer your lasagna on top of it? Does it make a difference? Yeah, so good question. And I gotta give a little backdrop to answer that. So the, the standard lasagna garden or sheet mulch garden, generally, if you're not trying to do an instant garden, not trying to do this mm -hmm. quick, you wanna put it down in the fall. Okay, that, that's when nature puts down all its materials. And this method of sheet mulching with you know, construction paper or newspaper or cardboard, you can definitely put that down right over your sod, good and thick, and then add your mulch or your compost and mulch. And if you're gonna do that, you do that in the fall, and then it has the fall, the winter, and into spring to really activate and work. Um, what we're trying to do here is accelerate the process. So while you know we're always trying to work with nature and mimic nature's um, systems, there's times when we want to accelerate those or, mm -hmm. or maximize those. And so in this case, we're trying to speed the process up in an instant garden. Right. So I cut the grass down to accelerate the process of things breaking down and also slow down the sod underneath it. Now, Usually if I was doing that, I would even dig up or till up the soil a little bit to loosen everything up and really help get it going. But I was in that, in this case, in this video, I was demonstrating doing it without any power equipment and, and making it pretty easy just by layering. 
So the grass just gets that material, gets it dead real fast. And, and I think in that video, I haven't seen it in a while, I even added some food scraps in there. Mm -hmm. That's just getting a bunch of nitrogen going, which is gonna charge that system underneath your sheet mulch to get it broken down because you're then going to place your you know your sheet mulch cardboard or whatever and then build up some soil on top where in that case you also need to use the compost so it just helps accelerate the process do you have to do it no um, i think it's just going to be a little bit better if you're doing this instant method and trying to get it going quickly mm, there you go good okay jody lund on fruit leather secret ingredient uh, I had to freeze my strawberries and now want to make fruit leather. Can I use those once thawed or will they be too watery? Ah, they, you can use them once they're thawed and you do want to save the juice that thaws out of them and use that also, especially if you're using the method that I share in that fruit leather secret ingredient video. That makes the best fruit leather. Oh, it's thick. It's not too tough like some regular fruit leather can often be like really like jerky um this is more like I don't know, it's like what you find in the grocery store i don't know what to say besides that that's really what it is so but if you're using that method you definitely want to keep all the juice from the defrosted strawberries but you can use any frozen fruit that works out just fine not yeah, funny how that's usually a compliment. We're trying to get away from the grocery store, but usually when we say it's just like the grocery store, it's because like that's that's the texture we're used to, or that's the thing we're used to. Yeah, and so this is this contradiction, right? Yeah, and one way we're always trying to get away from it, another way we'll refer to it. And I don't mean just you and I. I, I see a lot of people do this. You know, it's like, oh, that's just like in the grocery, just like the way you buy it. And it's like a compliment. It's like, wow, you got it, you nailed it. I, I and in remember, that case, I know that's what that reference is because that's what we're used to. Yeah, I remember the moment that I knew that. I had made it in making homemade bread. And that's when I put that loaf of bread on the table and you said, oh, why aren't you making our own bread? Like you said something about it being store-bought bread and I was confused <laughs> for a second. And then I realized you thought my homemade whole wheat bread was store-bought bread. And I was like, yes, It was all perfect loaf <laughs> and perfectly brown. <laughs> just right, just yeah, what I was looking great. for. Okay, graveyard addict, wow. Okay, I'm not gonna really ask where you came up with that, but Graveyard Addict, okay. On save money on groceries this year. Hello, I'm having a very hard time keeping my fresh produce fresh. Yep. Um, my celery gets limp in one week and the lettuce gets brown in two days. How can I keep produce fresh to last a week until the next big shopping day? This is a challenge. Yes, this is a challenge. And, uh, you know, obviously the great answer is we'll leave it in your garden until you're ready to harvest it. But even for us, there's seasons where we don't have fresh produce in the garden and you may not have fresh produce in your garden. You may not have a garden. Yeah, you're dealing with the so, grocery store. Yeah, here. you have to go to the grocery store and that's reality. Um, so usually this comes down to storage i do have a few tricks for this one is find out when your grocery store gets lettuce delivered lettuce is the worst for this if you need to like you live out of town a ways and you need to go do a big grocery shopping and then like you know bring it home and it needs to last you for a few weeks for you to be able to eat your veggies um, make sure you find out when your grocery store gets the lettuce and go when they have very, very fresh lettuce. That's, that's kind of my trick there. Kind of any produce, right? If you can. Any produce. I feel Especially. like the lettuce is the most susceptible, yeah. but yeah, um, because they often bring things in on different days. Yeah. So it's not just one day. Um, when you get home, get the lettuce out of the packages that it came in and you need to keep it dry. Lettuce goes bad because it gets wet or it gets damp. So one thing that I do, and I even do this with our um, homegrown lettuce, I'll go out and cut a bunch so we have easy salads for lunch or for dinner. I actually take a whole one of the produce bins in mm -hmm, the refrigerator. Drawers. I take the whole drawer out, I clean it, I like disinfect it with well, with vinegar, we can't technically call that disinfecting it, but I make sure it's really, really mm. clean, um, really, really washed. And then I layer some towels in there and then I put the lettuce directly in that layered in additional towels. You could use paper towels if you wanted and then make sure the whole thing's covered up with a towel on the top. That's gonna keep it really dry and that's the important part. You could also, if you're getting like those clamshell boxes, take some out, layer paper towels, or a regular towel, like a real absorbent cotton towel, and then put it back in, put another layer. 
Um, something like that is really the key trick for the lettuce to get it to last a little bit longer. Um, celery. Celery is a little bit hard because it does go limp really quickly, but if you cut it, if you prep it and store it in water, it does much, much better in your refrigerator. So the opposite of the lettuce. It's the opposite of the lettuce. You want it in wet, in cold water. So prep it, either slice it or just, you know, take the top and the bottom off and get it into sticks and then put it in like a big one of those glass Tupperware things. Um, or even a mason jar and just make sure it's covered in water and that will make it last much, much longer. Carrots store like that really well um, if you it, have some carrots. Does it help to add ice to that? Like if you really want to extend that, like cooling water off even a little I never tried more that. I do not know that. Yeah, yeah, because you don't want it to get to freezing, but you know. Yeah, the ice would, the ice would just cool the water would just down cool it a little down, bit, probably. which seems like that would help. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. it might. So there are kind of tricks and you have to know them because each produce is a little bit different the way you want to store them. Don't store basil or tomatoes in the refrigerator. Like leave them on your counter. Uh, basil, just put it in a little jar of water like you would a bouquet of flowers and leave it out on your counter. Um, so you kind of have to like find the trick for each type of vegetable. That would probably make a really good video all by itself. Like go through a bunch of the probably different would. veggies. Yeah, you, because... could, you could do like coming out of the, off the homestead, but also from the grocery store and the differences yeah. and everything. Because there, there's a lot of things that are challenging like this and you, you can't grow everything. So we all got to go to the grocery stores for some things at times. So right. it makes a lot of sense. I got to give a plug though for gardening a little bit, because if you're a lettuce eater, I'm guessing here, because you're really talking about that. So you're probably buying quite a bit of lettuce. Lettuce is a great, like chickens are kind of the gateway to homesteading and animals and stuff. Lettuce is a great gateway to gardening. It uh, is easy to grow. It doesn't take a lot of space. You can grow a lot of it in a small space and it's a really great starting point and mm -hmm. then you can harvest it fresh um, and eat it fresh all the time or at least it's going to store a lot better because you're harvesting it and getting it right in the method Carolyn's using. So anyways, yeah. just want to encourage you to be growing some food if you can and uh, that is, is actually a really good place to start if, if you're not doing anything yet. Yeah. Yep. Good. Cool. Let's see, Lisa Lisa on Easy Fresh Bread Every Night. Can you add herbs and other items to the dough that you pull out of the main dough to change up the baked bread each night? If so, how would you do that and still use a Dutch oven? Uh, yes, you can. I would just knead them in in that final kind of stretch and pull time where you're working in your bucket um, or your big batch of dough. Um, but the real thing here is make sure you just go light on the seasoning because the longer that sits, the more intense that flavor is gonna get into the rest of the dough. So just make sure you go kind of light on that until you know what you like. Um, and especially, you know, until you know what you like when it's sat until you're using the last bit of dough for mm. the last loaf. That's kind of the real key to that one, so. Cool. But yeah, you can mix in all sorts of great things. All right, let's see. Quinani Doran on how to create an instant garden, same okay. video, yeah. asks a question. Can your soil have little rocks in it? Yes, absolutely. Uh, rocks are good as long as there's not so many of them that there's not enough soil to grow your plants in. Right. Um, you know, and it makes it hard to grow certain things. So they're good to a limited extent, but we've grown in very rocky soil, mm -hmm. done very well. Um, little rocks are just fine. They're a little bit of a nuisance, but they don't harm anything. And honestly, they actually, in good active soil, they are a source of minerals. So they're good. Our terrace garden has a couple of beds that are actually quite rocky. Oh gosh, we've got the, some large areas that are quite rocky. Yeah, yeah, but they grow great greens. They grow all sorts of yeah. great things, so. And, and if it is very rocky, this is again, I mean, I'm, I'm always gonna promote building soil up, not turning everything in every season, building up. And that's one of the things you do is just keep layering up and eventually you start to get up above the rocks a little yeah. bit. We, we had a place when we first came to Idaho, we had to do that for like three years before I could plant any root crops, three <laughs> or four years of heavy, heavy layering. Yeah, but works. Very rocky. <laughs> Let's see here, Elizabeth Ackleton. Elizabeth Ackleton. Hope I got that right, Elizabeth. On super fast and easy green beans. How long does fermenting last? How long to store and storing conditions, please? Ah, uh, this is a really good question because we're used to food kind of having an expiration date, but with fermented vegetables, you kind of don't have that problem. It, 
it's not really like it's gonna go bad at some point unless it gets moldy. It would get moldy because maybe the food drops below the liquid level um, or you're storing it for a long time without doing the sterilizing the, um, the, the container like we talked about in there. Um, or something gets introduced into that during a long period of storage. So that would be the way that it would go bad. Now, what does happen is ferments continue to get more and more sour as that lactic acid builds up. Um, they can also go mushy. In fact, they will go mushy. Eventually. Yeah. Um, however, on the counter, on the shelf, I've pulled off shredded carrots that I've had fermenting for two years. They've sat there for two years on the cool shelf, so it's not warm kitchen temperatures, but it's cool. Basement temperatures. Basement right? temperatures. 60s. In the 60s, yeah. yeah. It's not cold, but it's cool. And they've still been in phenomenal shape. So they can last a really, really long time, so you can keep going with that. In general, you want them to be as cool as possible for long-term storage. That's kind of your big thing, cool and you don't want them to be in direct sunlight, and the more you can keep them dark, the better. So a cabinet, a cool cabinet is like ideal. Yeah, and the cooler the better, right? If you can get it cooler. Yeah, you don't you want it to freeze. get into the like, lower 50s, is that where it starts to really slow down the fermentation? Really it. slows it down. If you can get under 55 degrees, it's pretty much, for the sake of a ferment, about the same as sticky in the refrigerator. It just slows that way, way yeah. down. Cool. Yeah. All right, uh, another one here on fermentation. Susie G on how to ferment for long-term preservation. How do we top off the water after active fermentation if we are not supposed to introduce anything into the jars when finished? Yeah, good mm -hmm. question. Just make sure you have very clean water. Freshly boiled or something distilled or something like that will work just fine. But you're right, you don't want anything that has a, uh, you know, a bacteria load in it. Yep. You want it to be real clean. Good. Okay, let's see. Melissa Stewart on meat in your compost. Mm -hmm. What about cooked foods that have meat in it? Would you place that in your compost pile also for no waste? Oh yeah, any of it. Now, we try to feed some of that higher value waste to the animals first, like yeah. the dogs. Um, the pigs, the chickens will all eat the meat and the high protein in your omnivores mm -hmm. uh, or carnivores on the property. So. That to me is a higher value than than the compost pile. So you know, I recommend doing that. You know, giving it to dogs is a whole other discussion. But um, if you can feed it to one of your farm animals, great. And then yeah, the compost, as long as it's you know organic and clean, you can put any food in there that you want. And the bones take a little while longer. And you know, occasionally we get a few bones popping up in our compost, but. Um, it's all good for the compost pile and it's better than throwing it away. Just hands down. There you go. Alrighty. Anna on fermented ginger carrots. What if mine has air pockets? Is it okay to mess with it in the jar the next day? Yes, the next day is fine. You have about five to seven days of active fermentation that you can kind of mess with it. <laughs> you can even add new produce if you need to to that process. Um, let's say you didn't have enough cucumbers on day one to start fermentation for all of them. You can come back on day three and add some more. Um, but once that active fermentation dies down, you really want to leave it alone at that point. Cool. So that's where you would stop. <laughs> all right. Allison Rittner on how she makes all her dairy in two hours. Why are you pasteurizing the milk? Exclamation question mark. Doesn't that kill the enzymes, et cetera, that help your body to digest it? Ah, uh, yes. This is a great question. And what she's referring to is me making yogurt in mm -hmm. that video. And yes, I do pasteurize my milk for yogurt. If you don't, within two generations, you're not making yogurt anymore. You're making clabbered milk because the native bacteria in the milk will take over whatever culture you have in there and you'll end up with a clabbered milk instead of a yogurt, uh, technically yogurt. And mm. it's really a matter of taste. Um, when you're culturing the milk, even if it's pasteurized, you are reforming all of the enzymes and all of the bacteria. So I know, you know, there's a real push towards raw milk. Raw milk is phenomenal to drink because it does have all those enzymes, all that good bacteria, all those things in there. It really helps you to digest it. 
cultured milk, even if it has started by being pasteurized, also has all of those enzymes and bacteria and all of those good things in it. By adding that bacteria back in, it recreates all of that, but it does it within a certain flavor and texture profile. So if you want to make good yogurt that also has all those things, but it tastes nice and clean, has the flavor you expect, has the texture you expect, then you really want to pasteurize and start with, you know, kind of like a clean slate and then add the correct bacteria that you're looking for into it. There is nothing wrong with clabbered milk. There's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with the wild bacteria. It just doesn't always do what you expect it to do because you don't really know what bacteria you're working with. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's gonna give you flavors that you're not expecting. Those could be great flavors. They could be kind of odd flavors that you're not excited about. They could be downright bad flavors that you're like, ooh, I don't really like that. Um, they can give you off textures too. So instead of like thickening up like that nice thick yogurt, they could get kind of stringy and ropey mm -hmm. and a little bit slimy. Um, so, you know, you, that's the benefit of the yogurt is you really know exactly what you're dealing with time to time and you know what your, um, what flavor you're going to get out of it. Cool. So you can do both. You could do either, but there really isn't an inherent benefit to making yogurt with raw milk that you've never heated the raw milk. The only benefit to that is you're not taking the time to pasteurize it. Yeah, I think this kind of gets into that area of working with nature, you know, so just doing the clabbered milk and mm -hmm. that that's just kind of letting nature do its thing and you can right. get a good product out of it. But we often want to shape that process. So we're still mm -hmm. working with nature. We're just manipulating it to get a product that we want or to right. increase production or, you know, whatever the goals might be. And, yeah. and that really fits in here because there's just certain things that we want and that we enjoy. Right. Right. Yeah. And it doesn't, you know, doing that doesn't take away the value of raw. No. You know, and, and there's still a value to raw milk and, and certain raw products, but there's still value to these other products as well. I feel like this is one of those cases of like the pendulum swing. Mm -hmm. Like we were way over here, everything was pasteurized, we were scared of bacteria, and then we started going, wait, that's not right. And now mm -hmm. we've kind of swung over here where it's like everything has to be raw all the time, right. even the cultured milk. And so it's like, let's find the balance. Yes, please do not drink just plain pasteurized milk. It's not good for you. It's not good for your digestive system. Like, just don't do it. But you you want the bacteria and the enzymes. How it gets there, you know, we have options for how those bacteria and enzymes get there. It also gives you a lot of freedom within your homesteading journey and doing yeah. all these things. Living at these pendulum swings, whether it's the industrialized, sterilized over here, it's a lot of work. It's a big job. The ideal over here at Raw is also a lot of work and a big right. job. And, uh, Whatever, I lost my words. Job. Big job. <laughs> um, and so a lot of times, just to make things doable, sometimes maybe they're not always ideal. Yeah. But, you know, we want to make it doable. You want to make it enjoyable. You want things that you're going to enjoy, right. you know, and and that are accomplishable. So it's important to find balance in there to, to make this life doable and enjoyable. Yeah, it's yeah. a good question, though. Cool. Really good. Yeah. So I, tackle this one for his last one. Sure. I think. I think okay. We're down one there on time. more. Shannon Robson on how... on. Does homesteading save you money? How do you grow enough that it is ready to be harvested at the same time so that you can have enough to can it? I never have enough to make a canning recipe. Okay. Well, there's to me, there's several different topics in <laughs> yes. there, and you've got some perspective because this is garden all the way into the kitchen. And, um, you know, one of those is, is actually staggering some of your things. You know, you need to grow enough volume, right? So if you want to can green beans, well, you kind of got to know how much do you want to can mm -hmm. and, you know, grow enough green beans. So one, focus on a crop. Like if you're trying to learn how to figure this out, one year, focus on a major crop and we'll just use green beans because it's easy. Mm -hmm. Do more green beans that year, figure out what you need to grow, do your planning, you know, grow it, see how it goes right. and and get that down. Maybe you need to do that for a couple of years and you're growing less of other things, but you're, you're getting a system down. Yeah. Um, that's one way. All, the other thing is you can try to stagger some of your things so you don't have green beans, corn, mm -hmm. tomatoes, everything else at once that you want to can. Yeah. It might be that you just need to grow more of something too to have enough all at one time. Yeah. So you may just need to put in a couple extra plants and check the varieties. So if it's tomatoes, 
You want to make sure you're growing the determinate variety tomatoes for canning projects so that they do kind of come ripe all at the same time instead of a little bit here and there with the indeterminate. Unless so. you live in North Idaho and you just, you're doing anything you can to get any of it ripe in the time. Whatever. Tomatoes. Ripens early. <laughs> Hey, you guys, it's been great hanging out with you, and uh, we hope you have a great week. See you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>